staples in, in native culture especially is drink coffee. The, uh, the Yupik word for it is kofak. Um, and uh, to not drink coffee in, an, in a native person's house is all but an insult. Um, it is the thing. And when, when traders and stuff came up there, they would trade anything for coffee. That is their thing. They absolutely love coffee. It's okay. I drank coffee before I went to Alaska on a, on a trip there. But yes, I absolutely drink coffee. So uh, as he said, we're, we're headed to Bethel, Alaska. That's 400 miles west of Anchorage. The video kind of showed that out. Um, but please take a look at our, our display table back there. We have uh, prayer cards back there as well. Um, and then if you have any questions, please, uh, please see us afterwards. Um, we'd love to talk to you about it. We uh, like Alaska just a, just a little bit. If you hadn't noticed that yet, um, then you need to talk to us a little more, and you'll, you'll discover that maybe we like Alaska just a little more than a little bit. But uh, we, we really do love Alaska and the, and the people there. It's a very, very, very needy place. It's very, very, very spiritually dark. Um, there's, there's not a gospel preaching church around every corner, two hours away, wherever. You're not just going to show up and, and find a good church to go to. If you do show up in one of those villages, there's probably one church, and it is Russian Orthodox, Catholic, or Moravian. And that's your options. That's, that's really all there is. Most people, you, we were working there with the young people in Bethel last um, summer, and everybody, if they came for, I think it was three days, got a free Bible. And most of the kids are like, what is that? They have no idea. They do not know what a Bible is. We're, we're, talking, we're giving them uh, Bible lessons. Well, who is Jesus? Why is he important? And you just have to, you have to back all the way up to the beginning. They have no idea. There is, there is no knowledge, largely. There, it, is, it is very, very, very dark. There, there is no knowledge of God. They do not know who he is. They do not know why... Why would we worship God? Who is he? What, why, are, why are we talking about him? And they, they really do not have um, a knowledge of God. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. I'm sorry, chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I appreciated the song, Willing to Do. You know, one of the hardest things I struggled with um, in my earlier life, I'm, I'm from a family of, of 10, just to, just to clarify um, so, I'm a middle child. That's good and bad. You know what happens to middle children? It's okay, I'm not complaining. But you, do you know what happens to middle children? The older ones, well, they pick you apart because you're younger. The younger ones, well, they pick you apart because you're older, but you're not the oldest. Okay? So, there's, three, there's always, in my opinion, there's always three sections in the family. You have the oldest, you have the middle, and you have the youngest, if, if there's enough children, obviously. Um, and uh, the middle children get it all. They are the forgotten children because the younger ones, well, they need mommy. And the older ones, well, they take care of themselves. And so the middle ones, well, they're just there. That was me. Um, but you know what? One thing I struggled with greatly as a young person was how can God use me? I don't talk very good. I still don't, in case you're wondering. You've probably noticed that by now. How can God use me? Because I knew I was called to the ministry. But how can God use a guy who stutters around, who can't hardly get his thoughts out, who cannot read straight, how can God use me? And you know, one of the hardest things for me was getting over the fact that, you know what? If you think you've got to be great to be used of God, then you've missed something in your Bible. And it took me a long time to realize that. You know, Moses, he came to God, God called him, and he says, God, I can't even talk. God, don't make me go to Pharaoh. You know, you look at everybody else in the Bible, and you could look at example after example after example. God uses normal people. You know, missionaries aren't some highfalutin people. They're just like you. They're people who every day they get up and they lace their shoes just like you do. They're people who get up and they live their lives largely just like you do. But you know what? Something that oftentimes they do have is a love for the Lord. They have to. Because you know what? You don't survive in a missions field. You don't survive in, in a group of people who largely do not know Christ without Christ. You, you just can't survive in that. And you know what? You can't either. You might get along for a time, but you're not going to make it in the long haul. Anyways, off of that to uh, Romans chapter 10. God can use anybody. We just have to be willing to do it. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 is where we'll be at this morning. 
The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts through it this morning. Help us to learn from it. Help us to understand it. Lord, I pray that we would uh, leave not the same that we came here, but, Lord, that you would have worked in our hearts, that we would change things in our lives, that we would draw closer to you this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, speak to us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Look there at uh, verse 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a very, very common verse. Hopefully, we all know that verse. Hopefully, many of us have used that verse witnessing. But verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You know, it only makes sense. It's only logical that we cannot believe something we've never heard about. That only makes sense, right? We can't put our faith in something we, don't know, we do not know exists. We, we just can't do it. We have to have something to believe something, right? That's just common knowledge. You know, you all believe right now that those chairs will hold you up, all right? We all believe something, but we have to have something to believe. You know, the people up there in Alaska, they do not know, many, many, many of them, as I just mentioned, they do not know who Jesus Christ is. They do not know that there is a God that loves them, that sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for them. They don't know that. And, you know, they're not just going to wake up one morning and be like, you know, I think I'm going to turn to Jesus Christ because they don't know about him. They can't do that. They don't know. They cannot believe in something they do not know exists. Now we understand that, that God lights every man that cometh into the world. And if they seek after God, God will make himself known to them. But they will not believe if they do not first hear. Go over to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Verse 10. The Bible says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We have several, several passages we'll be turning to, so keep your, keep your fingers limber. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who represents someone to someone else. Usually, one government to another government, right? They're a representative. They're a go-between, if you will. They're a mouthpiece, if you will. We have one in our church. He represents one government to another government. So, a question for you. If an ambassador comes to one government, and, and he's talking to that government, and the government says, we like your plans, we think it's great, keep it up, it's, it's really good. And then he goes to the other government... And he says, yeah, they said your plans stink. If you keep it up, it's bad news. I have a question. Is he a truthful ambassador? No, he's lying, right? But you know, if we as Christians, we claim the name of Christ, we claim we're saved, we claim we have Jesus Christ in our heart and life, but we do not live according as he commanded us, what are we? We're lying ambassadors. You know, the Bible says, now then, we our ambassadors for Christ. And you know, if we claim the name of Christ, we claim we have Jesus Christ in our heart and our lives, we claim we love Him, but our lives do not reflect that, then we're just like the man who is telling the governments two different things. He's lying between them. You know, God knows our heart. God knows whether He's actually in there or not. But... Do other people know that, too? You know, how does God, what is God's method to reach the lost? It's, it's through ambassadors, right? 
God could have printed on the, on the palm of everyone's hand, Jesus saves. He could have printed on there. And, they, and when they're born, it reads right there on their hand, Jesus saves. He could have put it on their forehead backwards so that when they look in the mirror, it reads Jesus saves. But you know, we look at that and we say that's foolish, but he's God. He could have done it, but he did not choose to do that. He chose to use you and I. He chose to use Christians to proclaim his word. You know, we, we're left here on this earth for that purpose. If God was done with us when we got saved, then I have a question, and I know the answer, but why are we still here? You know, if God was done with us when we got saved, then he would just take us out. But he's not. We have another purpose. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Go over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Luke said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see there, God's desire is that the world get saved, right? Right? But verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. If you're saved today, you are not condemned. There is no fear of hell if you are saved today. You are sealed under the day of redemption, the Bible says. But verse 18, it continues on there. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If you're here this morning and you are lost, you're condemned. You're, you're condemned to hell. And you know, the Bible lays out very, very, very clearly that we will all spend eternity in one of two places. We will all die and go to heaven with Jesus Christ, or we will all die and burn in hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. The Bible lays that out very clearly, but here in verse 18, he that believeth not is condemned already. If you're here and you're lost this morning, you are condemned. The only thing you have to do To go to hell is to die. You take your last breath and you will be in hell. You don't need to be a bad person. You don't need to rob a bank. You don't need to murder someone. You are condemned already. According to the Bible, you are condemned already. But you know, Jesus Christ, he he didn't leave it there. He didn't leave it there. According to verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever... Believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, if you're here this morning and you are not saved, you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, get that taken care of today. I cannot imagine living with the uncertainty of eternity. Hell is an awful place. We could look at the, at rich, the rich man and Lazarus and how all he wanted was one drop of water to cool his tongue. But there was no hope. It was too late. He had his chance while he was alive. And he blew it. He had opportunity. But he didn't take it. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, don't waste your opportunity. Don't use it up. Because you will run out of opportunity. People die all the time of car accidents. People die all the time of just Dying for no reason really at all. Don't waste your opportunity to get saved. Get saved today. But Christians, let's continue looking here. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I have a a question. Would we say that the vast majority of the world are Christians or lost? Lost. 
I think we could all agree with that. The Bible would agree with us. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Um, so if the vast majority of the world is lost, according to verse 17, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. According to Luke, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. But we would all agree that the vast majority of the world is lost. I have a question then. How, how does, the, does that vast majority that is lost go from getting lost to saved? It's through ambassadors. It's through people proclaiming the word of God. And you know, I have another question here too. If we know that the vast majority of the world is lost, we know that according to verse 18, they're condemned already. How little do we have to think about them to not tell them the gospel? How little do we have to consider them and their fate to not tell them of Jesus Christ? According to Romans... They can't believe if they don't hear. According to 2 Corinthians, we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So, again, how much do we have to think of them to not tell them of Christ? I would say we, can I use this word? We hate them, honestly, to not tell them of Christ. We know their destiny. We know they're condemned. We know where they're bound to. We know the punishment for their sin. And we have the answer. We have the anecdote for their poison, if you will. We have the solution for their problem. We have the key for them to escape their punishment. Do we use it? Do we give it to them? Do we tell them? That there's a God that loves them? Do we tell them there's a, there's a Christ who came, He died for them, He paid their price. They don't have to pay their price. He already paid it, but they do have to take His payment. They have to trust Him. Do we, do we tell them that? Let's go back to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? I want to see an example of this. Acts chapter 8. Go over to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And Philip desired that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Here you have a man, this Ethiopian. He had the very word of God, at least a portion of it. He had the Bible. He was reading the very word of God but he did not understand it. And we understand it was the Old Testament. It was harder to see the gospel in the Old Testament. It was there, but it was harder to see. And that's what he's reading here. But he's reading the Bible. He doesn't get it. He says, How can I except some man should guide me? And you have Philip here, who he's on the backside of the desert by commandment of the Lord. He's there on purpose because one man was seeking God. 
but he wasn't getting it. And here you have Philip in verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. I, I have this, just, just a question. Um, how many got saved from reading your Bible or a gospel track alone? Anybody? No one. Okay. Um, here's what I would say. Please don't misunderstand me, but here's what I would say. You know, handing someone a gospel track is not witnessing to them. Do you want to know statistically what happens to gospel tracts? Please don't misunderstand me. They're very useful. They should be given out everywhere. But it is not the equivalent. Do you know what happens to a lot of them? They get thrown away. But you know, your life is visible. Your life can be seen. Your voice can be heard. And you know, please don't misunderstand me. We shouldn't be jerks either, okay? Um, but your words can be heard. And you know, the Bible says it has to do with hearing as well. It, it talks a lot about hearing in Romans there. How shall they hear? How shall they believe if they don't hear? Faith cometh by hearing. And you know, witnessing to someone and giving someone a gospel track is not the same thing. We should do both. Please don't misunderstand me. Gospel tracks, definitely they plant seed. They should be used. But it is not the equivalent of witnessing to someone. And, you know, here's a man. He had the gospel track, if you will. He had the word of God, this, this Ethiopian here. But it didn't make sense to him. The plan of salvation is, is deathly simple. But this, this man did not understand it. He had the Old Testament. He did not understand it. He had the gospel track. It didn't make sense to him. But you know, Philip came along and Philip opened his mouth and preached unto him Jesus. And if you're saved today, you know how you got saved. If you're saved today, you can preach the gospel. By the way, preaching the gospel and being a pastor is not the same thing. We're all called to preach the gospel. We're all called to proclaim the gospel. Um, you don't have to be a pastor to do that. We're all supposed to do that. But here's a man. He had that gospel track and it did not make sense. But if you got saved, then you know how, you know how it makes sense to you, right? Then you can tell it to someone else, right? And that's what we should be doing. Let's go back to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Our desire is, is in the Lord's timing to start a church in one of these villages up there in Alaska. And as the Lord leads, our ultimate desire is also that that church would grow. That that church would see others perhaps take over that church or be sent out from that church to reach other areas with the gospel. But you know, according to verse 15, how shall they preach except they be sent? You know, no one is going to be sent out from Quethlick. No one is going to be sent out from Antioch. No one is going to be sent out from Kalskag, these villages up there, if no one ever preaches the gospel. If they do not first get saved, if they do not turn to Jesus Christ, if they are not then sent out, no one will be sent out from there to reach the lost elsewhere. Our desire is, is to see that happen, but it will never happen if someone first does not reach that area first. If they do not get saved, they cannot preach. If they do not get saved, they cannot be sent out to go elsewhere and spread the gospel. And that is our desire to do. Let's look at an example of this as well. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Verse 26. Luke chapter 8, verse 26. 
And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee? Jesus, thou Son of God, most high, I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oft times it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. Let me pause there for just a second. Do you see here the, the devils, by the way, they sought this man's destruction. He was possessed with these devils, and it says they, they bound him with chains and fetters. They were trying to protect this man. They were trying to keep, himself from, keep him from hurting himself. If you read the other passages, he was cutting himself. He was living in the tombs. That's not normal. People don't want to live in tombs. People don't want to just cut themselves. It's satanic. But you know, the devil, they sought this man's destruction. And they tried and tried and tried to destroy this man. But then Jesus cast them out. But look. He besought, they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep. So Jesus, they, they asked Jesus, don't command us to go out into the deep. But there's these, there's these swine, there's these hogs, there's these pigs feeding here. Let's go into them and possess them. So he lets them. But notice exactly what happens as soon as they possess these pigs. They're just a bunch of pigs. But look, then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake, and were choked. They didn't want to go into the deep. They wanted to go into these pigs. But what did they do to these pigs? They destroyed them immediately. And you know, you can serve Satan, and he seeks your destruction. You can serve Satan all your life, and he will just try to destroy you all your life. And you know what? When he's done destroying you, he will go to another one, and he will destroy them. And he will destroy them. And he will continue to destroy. Why? Because Satan is a destroyer. And that is what he desires to do. But you know what? There's a solution. You can trust Jesus Christ. And you know, I'm not here to tell you that you're going to have a blissful life with Christ. But I am here to tell you that through all the trials, through all the hardships that you might endure with Christ, at the end of the day, there will be a reward and there will be a home in heaven. Your option is you can serve Satan all your life. You can even enjoy pleasure of sin for a season, the Bible says. And at the end of the day, you will burn in a devil's hell for all eternity. The choice seems pretty clear to me. But if you're here and you're not saved, consider it. You will pay high prices to serve Satan. And if you're not saved, you are serving Satan. He is your master. And you can serve him all your life. And you will spend eternity with him as well. Or you can serve Christ. And yes, there may be hardship. There may be struggles along the way. But there will be reward in the end. Consider it. If you're not saved today, get saved today. Trust in Christ while there's time. You don't know when your life is done. But let's continue reading on here, Christians. There's something here for us as well. Verse 35, Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devil that was possessed of, of the devils, was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear. And he went 
up into the ship and returned back again. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published through the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. Here's a man, he was possessed with devils. Jesus set him free. And you know what? He immediately desired, Jesus had to leave, but he desired to be with him. But Jesus did not allow that. He said, return to thine house. Show how great things God hath done unto thee. And one man, one man, he returned home. And it says he published through the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. And it came to pass that when Jesus returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. According to the Bible, this, this place, all the people were gladly waiting to receive Jesus because one man obeyed. Because one man was a witness. He was commanded to be. You know, you never know who you're going to witness to. But I'll also say this, that if you don't witness to someone, that no one will get saved by your, by your witness. I'm not saying that you're going to witness to one person and the, and the whole state of Arkansas is going to get saved or, or whatever the case may be. But if you don't witness to anyone, no one will get saved by your testimony. One man, he obeyed, he followed, and God used him in a mighty, mighty way. God wants to use you. God desires to use you. But he doesn't force you to be used. Will you allow yourself to be used? Will you obey? Will you follow? You know, James talks about, I believe it's James, says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, if we, if we claim that we love Jesus Christ, then are we reading his word? Are we studying his word? Are we living by his word? Or are we too caught up in things of this world? You know, everything in this world will melt with a fervent heat one day. What's done for Christ will not. What's done for eternity will last. Riches, a big house, whatever it may be, I, I don't know what it is. It will all be destroyed in one day. I know in our area back home, sports is a huge, huge thing. And I have nothing against sports at all. I believe sports are, are, are great, they're fun. But you know what? If sports keep you out of church, then what is your God? What is your God? Again, I have nothing against sports. But look at the statistics. 0.02 of 1% will ever make it to a professional team. And of those... Very, 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 very few ever make it to anything worth making a career out of. But, you know, we have a God that we can make a career out of. We have a God that loves us. We have a God who commands us to serve him, but he doesn't force us to. He lets us choose. He lets us decide that for ourselves. Romans chapter 10, and we'll be finished. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You can take all religion right there and sum it up in verse 3. The Russian Orthodox, the Moravians of today, the Catholics, they're going about to establish their own righteousness, but they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. But verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. We looked at desire a little bit in the Sunday school hour. 
But here you see Paul's desire again. He says his prayer and desire. Notice it's both. His prayer and desire was for Israel to be saved. Do you desire to see souls saved? Do you desire to see people one to Christ? Do you desire to live a Christian life? By the way, Christian means Christ-like. Christian doesn't mean you're saved. It means Christ-like. Do you desire to live a life that reflects Christ? Because if we don't have a desire to, we're sure not going to have any drive to. We're sure not going to have any willpower to. If we don't desire it, then we're not going to pray and ask God to help us in it. You know, I would encourage you, if you don't have a desire for it, then pray and ask God to give you a desire for it, because he will. He wants us to follow him. But where is our desire? Has it strayed? Is it on the things of God? Is it on what he would have us to do? Or has it strayed off somewhere? If you're here and you're lost and you're not saved, turn to Christ today. Don't serve Satan. He will destroy you and he will find another to destroy. He is no respecter of persons. Consider it today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray that you would just help us now. Lord, work in our hearts. Help us to be the Christians you would have us to be. Lord, if there's someone here that's not saved, I pray that they would turn to you today. But Lord, help us, the rest of us, to, uh, to just follow you, to obey your commands to live our lives as you would have us to. Help us not to get distracted in the world that we live in. Lord, I understand we have to live in it, but help us to, to live in it as you would have us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Watson.